Hello, everyone. I'm Ravi Sundaram from CSDS. I'm very delighted uh, to introduce to us uh, Adam Arvidsson. Uh, Adam is a professor of sociology at the University of Naples. Uh, Adam has taught at Copenhagen, Milan, and now in Naples. And Adam has written on brands and consumer culture, creative and digital industries, and also on peer production and new forms of organization in the digital economy. And his books include He's very prolific. Uh, marketing modernity, it Italian advertising from fascism to postmodernity, the ethical economy, rebuilding value after crisis, a very nice introduction to uh, digital media, which is being updated with Alessandro Del Fanti, with whom I've spoken in the past. His newest book is Change Makers, The Industrious Future of the Digital Economy from Polity Press in 2019. So, but today, Adam is not going to speak on the digital. He is uh, speaking on a new project, uh, laying out a set of new ideas on the legacy of the social after COVID, what COVID does to the idea of the social. Because, you know, COVID actually reorganized and kind of reformatted a kind of time space for all of us in this room and for the world. So it demands and it calls upon us as social thinkers to reflect on our intellectual infrastructure. So over to you, Adam. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ravi. Thank you very much for this very nice introduction and thank you for inviting me and having me here. And um, it's been a truly enjoyable couple of days and hopefully will give rise to a number of future um, cooperations and collaborations, etc. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about this new book idea that I have and the tentative, tentative title is Living Together in the Anthropocene. Uh, and it's a book that um, I started thinking about a little bit during the um, COVID times, during the lockdown years when all of us had nothing to do, basically. <laughs> to, um, and that I've be continued to try to conclude, but um, I haven't really been able to finish it because uh, I'm sort of able to speak about what you call the pars destruens, right? I mean, they have to show how this COVID experience in some way, as Ravi said, shattered uh, the social as we remember it and as we know it, but I haven't yet been able to figure out how to do the pars construence, that is to say, what, of what would a new type of social possibly look like in the end? I mean, maybe that is an overly ambitious theme in a sense, right? And maybe one should limit oneself to simply highlighting certain issues and concepts that might be, uh, might be the basis for a further reconstruction. We'll see how that goes. So I'm going to limit the presentation today to the pars destruence, and then maybe afterwards, we can have a discussion of if it is indeed even possible to address the other part, so to say, right? Um, and the premise for this in a certain sense is that the Anthropocene as it's being um, conceived generally under its very many different names in social theory, Capitalocene, Chutlocene, Plantatiocene, et cetera, et cetera. Um, all of these different perspectives are united by the um, the idea that this is something that you know, shatters the nature, culture, or nature social boundary that is the basis of modernity. Right? I mean, the modern project, in some sense, ever since its uh, inception, has been about this keeping the two domains separate in order to enable the objectification of nature by the social and the extraction of value from nature or whoever is considered part of nature or configuration that has changed, of course, in different historical circumstances. But of course, this sort of this new radical porosity that this COVID pandemic um, introduced to us uh, somehow um, obliterates that difference. And by obliterating that difference, it also shatters the very nature of the modern social itself. In a sense, it becomes incredibly, uh, increasingly obvious to us to this idea of a modern social is no longer a, a viable project uh, politically or ethically or, or even perhaps empirically. Right? Um, so um, the question then, of course, is, um, and this is the impossible project, of course, right, is how can we possibly reconstruct a new notion of the social, right? And it's not that ideas are missing. There are a number of uh, more or less uh, abstract no and utop utopian notions that are circulating as to how we can live in the Anthropocene. There's a lot of visions within science fiction. There's a lot of visions within what's called speculative theory. There's a lot of visions in, in things like 
uh, singularities, post-humanism, degrowth, all of these things are circulating around, but they all remain fairly abstract or even mythological and above all, very, very far away from the realities and aspirations of most people on the globe today and realities and aspirations that are, I think, marked by the dual tendency of, on the one hand, growing insecurity and precarity linked in part to financialization and in part to the sort of the, the to the condition of the Anthropocene itself. Um, and then importantly, also racing aspirations, which are uh, also linked to the uh, growing mediatization of subjectivities and existences around the world, right? We now have 5 billion smartphones circulating around the world, which means that virtually everybody has a vision of what life with an iPhone in hand looks like and is able to aspire to this. Something that just 20 years ago was, you know, isolated to not just the elites, but at least to the global middle classes, so the same. So there is a growing contradiction in that. And the question, of course, is how do you align these things, right? And from a sort of a, a Gramscian perspective, how do you construct a social block that is able to somehow align theoretical visions of what a sustainable or resilient existence might look like with the practical um, aspira asp aspirations and desires and, and, and political will of ordinary people. And that's, of course, is an incredible challenge, which I, I mean, I'm not suggesting that I have the, the ability to, uh, to address it, but perhaps the contribution of the book would be at least just to pose the question and to maybe conceptualize it in ways that are a bit more detailed, so to say. Um, and in order to do that, I'm going to uh, try to depart from um, an idea of using the COVID experience as a method. So it's, this book is not really about COVID per se. I'm not going to engage in debates about lockdowns and social distancing and whether they were efficient or not, et cetera. Uh, but I'm just going to say, to think that, follow the idea that this experience, uh, these three years um, highlighted and, and, and a number of tendencies of social fragmentation that have been going on for, for a long time, right? Um, at least since the, uh, since the crisis of Fordism in the early 1970s, and that now became visible in new levels of clarity, right? Uh, and following, in a certain sense, uh, Bruno Latour's imperative that we use, we see COVID as a sort of a, as a dress rehearsal, right? As some sort of uh, thing that can prepare us for or, or uh, um, uh, confront us with what, um, what might be, you know, ever more salient features of, of the condition of the Anthropocene. And, um, and in a certain sense, I think that type of perspective is also reflective in, in common sense. Um, I mean, there is a common perspective of COVID being a, a world historical event uh, in ways that, for example, the Spanish flu was not, right? I mean, even though we now speak about the Spanish flu, but historians didn't really talk about the Spanish flu until 2020. Uh, I, I mean, I think, think Eric Hobsbawm dedicates like two sentences to the Spanish flu in his history of the 20th century. And the Spanish flu killed off 20 times more people than COVID. So it, it was it was definitely a much more severe pandemic than what COVID was. Um, and so so why is, is COVID so why was COVID so universally received as a transformational event? It's a bit difficult to say, maybe because it inaugurated the 2020s, which is the decade in which we are going to feel the consequences of the Anthropocene in in, in a very, very um, tangible way. I mean, predictions of, of, of these things are have tended to uh, approach the present with an alarming rate, right? And now people are saying that the 2020s are the decade in which these things are going to become really, really tangible. Um, and perhaps because it happened at a time where there was a general perception that things were already falling apart in accelerated ways, right? I mean, we've had all the, the Brexit and the Trump presidency and the populists movements around the world and an economic crisis, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so in a certain sense, the imperative of the, of the talk then and of the book is to sort of follow up on that type of um, general perspective and, and sort of see what COVID could highlight for us in a sense. Right? 
And what you can say is that um, uh, the experience of the COVID years um, clearly highlighted uh, two ways of living together, two modalities of sociality in some sense that came out very clearly. Um, one, of course, is the security-oriented social model, right, which was the universal response to, to the COVID pandemic. And in some sense, you could say that this was an attempt to uh, stay within the modern, right, an attempt to use modern technologies, modern political rationality, uh, science, um, and all of these things to defeat and or at least mitigate the consequences of the pandemic. Right? Um, security, of course, has a very long history, and you could say that security is one of the foundational. We also have the talk yesterday who described this also in, in very good detail, but I mean, you could say that security is one of the foundational concepts of modernity in a certain sense, going back all the way to early modern political thought, uh, Machiavelli, Hobbes, etc. And of course, security is one of the key terms of uh, Foucault's lectures on biopolitics and the the early formation of, of the modern state, et cetera, and going on also to up until uh, 19th century conceptions of civil society. And Marx, for example, famously claimed security as the fundamental principle of civil society, the, the ability of the state to protect the personal integrity and property of the citizen, right? As a fundamental. Um, and of course, during the 19th century, particularly as a response to the cholera epidemics, uh, security rises to the fore of modern statecraft and um, culminating them with the triumph, the triumph or the, the, the establishment of hygiene movements and hygiene politics after the First World War and particularly in response to the Spanish flu, right? So we have um, a progressive sort of establishment of security as a key principle of modern statecraft and the way in which security was conceived already from the start, of course, is that uh, that of uh, maintaining a boundary uh, between, on the one hand, a bubble of um, predictability and order, and on the other hand, the elements that are sort of threatening that bubble, which are supposed to be kept away, and these can be elements can be um, you know, biological threats in terms of contamination, cholera, et cetera, but they can also be um, ideological threats in terms of revolutionary movements and um, uh, the unruliness of crowds and the popular classes, et cetera. And usually the two things were combined in the 19th century. The threat of cholera was also, to a large extent, the threat of urban revolts and also the threat of geopolitical contamination, the famous cordon sanitaire by Adrian Proust uh, suggested in the 1860s, uh, was of course to a large extent to keep the cholera infested Indian subcontinent isolated from the purity of, of Europe. Right? So these things were, went very much hand in hand in a sense. And, and there is a story about this, which we all know very well, and I'm not gonna reiterate, but of course security Converge and becomes sort of, in a certain sense, the main principle of modern statecraft uh, in the wake of the 9-11 attacks in 2001 uh, and leads up to, to a, a new type of uh, conception of governmentality where this type of, you know, keeping the, keeping the contamination and the threats out becomes a, a prominent principle. But there's also an important transformation of security that takes part in the post-war years, a, 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 a transformation that I think can be identified as following two different axes. Um, one is, of course, that in the post-war years, particularly, the concept of security is transformed from the notion of protection from concrete risks to the protection from abstract risks, right? Um, like the famous curve that during the COVID years was dictating essentially the implementation of different, you know, the relaxation or strengthening of, of um, uh, anti-COVID measures. Um, and the other dimension is the security becomes ever more a matter of governing intimate conduct. Right? So if the 19th century conception of security was that of a protection of the bourgeois and his or her, but mostly his perhaps, private sphere, um, you now get a conception of security as 
based on the intervention in this private sphere. And so we have a whole series of measures during the 60s and 70s that testify to this, right? Uh, seat belts being introduced in the 1970s, for example, something that at the time was understood to be a serious violation of, of, of individual rights, uh, motorcycle helmets, passive smoking, um, and going on, of course, to then internet habits, uh, internet security, similar things like that. Right? Um, all based on um, the legitimate limitation of personal freedom and choice in the private sphere in view of an abstract risk reduction. Right? There's an excellent Volvo commercial that says basically that in 1971, we uh, invented the seat belt and everybody thought that this was a threat to personal freedom, but we saved millions of lives. Now we're going to put up video cameras in, on the, drive, in the driving seats and that way we're going to save even more millions of lives. Right? So that's that the sort of the, the reasoning behind it in a certain sense. Right? Um, there's also another parallel to the rise of this new type of security during the, the 70s and 80s, which is located, of course, to uh, finance and financialization, right? In the starting in the 70s, but particularly the 1980s, the enormous expansion of the financial economy and its detachment from the commodity economy uh, was driven by a new logic of securitization. Right? So the idea that you make money on financial markets, not by actually um, uh, intervening in the commodity economy, but by transforming in uncertainties into risk in different ways, right? So uncertainties into risk that can be that can be sold on and commodified in different ways. Um, and both the logic of this sort of, let's call it postmodern security, like post-war, postmodern security, and the logic of financial securitization are following the same principle of governmentality. They're both based on the uh, progressive datafication of social space, right? The gathering and availability on data of data on processes that can be algorithmically elaborated, um, and on the idea that um, social processes can be governed by an algorithmic reasoning that unfolds in a sort of an abstract data space, no? a, a data space that is not directly linked to that of everyday life, et cetera, right? For example, so if you look at predictive medicine, for example, there is obvi the obvious contradiction that, you know, if you, if you know that um, you belong to a category that has um, a certain number of percentage points higher risk of developing diabetes, uh, that has nothing to do with your own individual concrete case, right? When you go and speak to your physician or your doctor, he would immediately tell you that abstract statistics do not have any sort of relevance for your particular you know disease history etc right? right it doesn't mean that you get diabetes or that you don't get diabetes right it's just a, so in a similar way there is a sort of a shifting of of the decision level from the consideration of sort of concrete individuals and, and, and social relations to this abstract processing of data that can give rise to actuarian profiles of risk even Illich, uh, discussed this a lot in the 1960s. He wrote a book when he was vehemently critical of modern medicine in the early 1970s, uh, where he basically suggested this, that the transformation of medicine through this new introduction of probabilistic reasoning takes away this type of um, clinical, practical clinical knowledge, right? When medicine becomes a way of, you know, an, an instance of patients and doctors interacting as concrete individuals and tends to replace it with this type of actuarian reasoning. Something that he thought was terrible, and maybe apparently he died from refusing treatment to his cancer. So maybe he, he's been here too. Okay, right. So maybe. Um, <clears throat> anyways, um, and of course, this model of securitization uh, um, was also, um, you know, embraced. So um, 
what happened then during the COVID years was that uh, this sort of um, convergence of uh, postmodern security and financial securitization um, presented, like for a brief time, um, the possibility of a new social model, uh, which was rather quickly embraced by Silicon Valley and the uh, giants of digital capitalism. Right? Um, and these companies, so Silicon Valley and the platform economy was in very bad shape in 2019, right? Even Financial Times were writing articles saying, will Uber ever make money, et cetera, right? Uh, but of course, during COVID, uh, there's uh, enormous hopes on the part of uh, industry pundits and other expressions of Silicon Valley uh, that a new type of social existence um, based on sort of the replacement of convivial social uh, relations with the algorithmic management of uh, social interaction uh, desires, consumption, needs, et cetera, et cetera, could provide the sort of social model that would make the Silicon Valley giants finally work, right? So the idea that uh, if you have a situation where people live in isolation and they stay at home in their house and they shop on Amazon uh, and they socialize on Zoom and they flirt on Tinder and they watch Netflix and all these sort of things, then these enormous investments would, you know, finally start to pay off in a certain sense, right? Um, and the enthusiasm behind this, of course, made um, a lot of people um, project that somehow this new type of shut-in society, as it was called, would last forever, right? I mean, a lot of people during the COVID years talked about, we'll get back to the normal, but it'll be a new normal, right? Uh, it'll be a new normal where we are all, you know, socially distanced in a certain way. There was a conception that this would last, and particularly on part of the digital investor community and the amount of investments in um, platforms, warehouses. Um, warehouses became a really hot commodity in the time. Um, Artificial intelligence and robotics went up enormously during the COVID years, right? Uh, and we're seeing the fruits of that a little bit now with all these, uh, with all these new uh, chat GPA and and automatic content generation uh, AIs that are coming out. There are all effects of these investments that people in the if you read the business press, they say that the COVID years accelerated investments in artificial intelligence by about ten years, right? Because it was the idea that this is going to be the future, right? Um, and this model of a shut-in society was also paralleled by a new kind of a new kind of ethics, if you say so, right? Um, a sort of an ethics that, where the idea was that the, the 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 focal point of ethics is not so much individual choice, uh, but it's interpersonal contagion. Sense, right, so the point of ethics is not so much to regulate the interaction between uh, autonomous individuals as much as it is to protect people from the toxicity of the biological medium in which they are moving and operating. Right, and uh, this type of ethics were perhaps most clearly expressed in uh, Benjamin Bratton's book that we discussed before. Return of the Real Benjamin Bratton is a Californian design professor who wrote a small pamphlet during COVID years, where he explicitly, you know, uh, um, suggested, but also, um, you know, um, prophetized that in the future we are now in a shift. This is a this is a historical shift of the ethical condition. After COVID, ethics is no longer going to be about individual choice but it's going to be about what he calls um, um, understand, you know, understanding individuals as vessels for what he calls the bio-commons, right? So we are going to understand ourselves not as, individ not, as, not as individuals with free choice, but as 
you know, conglomerations of flows of biological material, data, language, etc. And our ethical duty in a certain sense is to protect others from the toxic effects of these flows as we channel them. And this, this type of understanding of ethics was of course, in a certain sense, concentrated in these types of mask debates or mask wars that were erupting, particularly in the United States. And, and in which Agamben and Bratton went into these discussions. Uh, Giorgio Agamben famously wrote these articles where he said that, you know, the masked face, he wrote an article called Un Paese Senza Volto, meaning a, a country without a face, right? Where the, the mask is a negation of the possibility of politics and civil coexistence, according to Agamben, right? And therefore, it need to be resisted. To which Bratton then instead responded that, no, 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 the mask is precisely the symbol of this new ethics. It's negating your individuality and your egoistic orientation to the self and showing your solidarity with this new type of biocommons, right? Mm -hmm. um, and just as we are losing this older humanist notion of, uh, of subjectivity being based in the face, we will develop new type of post-humanist forms of intimacy between masked faces, right? So in a certain sense, right? Um, what Agamben called this reduction of subjectivity to naked life is precisely what Bratton affirmed as the basis of a new type of post-human coexistence in a certain sense. Um, and there are also, of course, parallels between this type of notion of Bratton's notion of an ethics of biological contagion, which was at the time the emerging political paradigm at the US left, where in a certain sense, the notion of the way in which identity politics have evolved in the, in the US and particularly in US campuses, um, had it reached a level where in a certain sense, the issue of political solidarity uh, was not so much to fight against structural injustice, but to protect others from the potential toxic effects of language. Right? So that you'd have your your ethical responsibility was in a certain sense to to mask yourself, to handle your, you know, to, to limit your ability to do harm through language, right? Um, and also, where in a certain sense the the concept of of inter interaction um, increasingly would be filtered through things like safety protocols or identitarian masks, like I am interacting with you as a white man, as a homosexual, as something like that. And that is my, my sort of, my, my claim to rights and subjectivity in some way. Um, and on the left, this was also paired with hopes of neo-Keynesian revival, right? A lot of people during the COVID year started to think that um, the pandemic would lead to a situation where the state would affirm itself against capitalism and the market. Um, and, um, and that in a certain sense, there was this very strange notion on some parts of the left that the virus would be some sort of an ally in the fight against capitalism. So that the effects of, of the pandemic, the, the virus would somehow be, you know, the last incarnation of this disappearing radical subject that finally would allow the anti-capitalist forces to sort of cohere around the notion of safety as a paradigm for a new type of, of solidarity. Of course, it didn't work out that way, right? As we know, we, um, COVID did not change everything. We have no new normal. We have basically gone back to how it was before. We'd zoom a little bit more. Some people are still wearing masks, etc. But basically, it reverted pretty much to before. States, far from being um, active uh, in regulating capitalism in the neo-Keynesian way, have started rather gone the other way around. They've been incredibly in, uh, weakened by COVID. Public indebtedness have increased enormously, particularly among um, what was used to be known as developing countries, um, and generally, you know, the political chaos uh, caused. In to some extent, by reactions against these security measures of bringing havoc to countries like 
Italy and the United States and Germany, et cetera, et cetera. So there seems to be, you know, the opposite thing in a certain sense have happened, right? And the security regime in this sense thrown also shown, you know, security as a social model, a security-based social model um, ended up being ultimately unsustainable uh, from a social and psychological point of view, we all know all these various reports of increases in mental health and alcohol abuse and domestic violence and other things like that that followed with this type of, with the shot in society in an ecological, from an ecological point of view, in the sense that the counter COVID measures generate an enormous amount of waste and debris. Apparently, there are now more masks floating around in the Mediterranean than jellyfish. Uh, and this is something that are going to be have to be dealt with, like as a sort of contribute in a certain sense to, to the very, very, uh, to the very origins of the problem in a sense. But also, you know, from a very strictly economic point of view, uh, it didn't either work out because um, as soon as these uh, stimulus packages and loose monetary policies ended in early 2020, the digital economy collapsed, right? First the crypto economy and then venture capital. And, you know, by now nobody, nobody believes that the middle classes will save capitalism through their Zoom calls and Amazon purges, right? That's an idea that's not even... So in that sense, this, this, you could say that security paradigm sort of showed ultimately unsustainable in a wide variety of different ways. So, um, there were, of course, an enormous amount of reactions to and resistance to these uh, security model and, and the shot in society overall, uh, particularly towards the second year of the pandemic when the immediate fear level sort of uh, went down generally. Um, and these reactions were, um, as they sort of matured, uh, they were mainly driven by the people who were hardest hit by security restrictions and shut down society in general. And, and, and you could say that the studies that have started to come out on things like the German Queerdenken and the Canadian Freedom Convoy and the Italian anti-vax movement, etc., shows that, I mean, there are a wide variety of people who participate in that, but there is a core that you can identify as the, what I call the industrious strata outside of the knowledge economy. So by industrious, I mean small-scale entrepreneurs, right? So the core strata of this is people like, you know, people who have um, work in logistics, uh, truckers, owning your own truck. A lot of the truckers in the Freedom Commune own their own trucks or small-scale entrepreneurs are heavily, heavily hit by the restrict movement restrictions between US and Canada border, et cetera. Um, people who, um, you know, taxi drivers, people who have small shops, people who have small cafes, people who work in industrial services. I mean, the whole sort of uh, small scale entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial non-knowledge uh, 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 economy, which in itself has grown massively, uh, at least in the West, as a part of post fordist restructuring, right? the whole sort of outsourcing and the massive increase in the logistics sector, which comes in the rust in time movements, et cetera, et cetera. These were the ones that are the bearing bone of these protests. And they were protesting against security restrictions in the name of higher risk tolerance. They wanted higher risk tolerance. They said, you know, Okay, maybe COVID is dangerous, but I want to make a I want to make a living, uh, and I you know I'm prepared to accept a higher probability of getting COVID to be able to go on with my life, etc. Right? Um, so there was a sort of a politicization of risk on that part, but there wasn't really much else in the sense that they didn't have a project that went beyond uh, a sort of a political desire for the continuation of status quo, right? The whole political idea that they had was that we want things to turn back to normal. And there's even this Italian right-wing right -wing philosopher called Diego Fusaro who jumped on, he jumps on any bandwagon, he jumps on the anti-COVID bandwagon and he tweeted, we have to fight for things going back to 2019. Right? So that's like the political perspective that these people had. 
But it's interesting to note that when you go in and look at what they say and, you know, online and the books that they write, et cetera, et cetera, fairly soon these anti-COVID restriction protests, of course, the focal point in Italy and most of Europe and the US were the uh, vaccine passes, right? Uh, the protests against this fairly quickly turns into uh, resistance against second wave digitalization in general. Because these people, were, they were against vaccine passes, but they were also against platforms, platformization. They were against digital cash. Um, they were against 5G masks, which they burned down. Right? And 5G, of course, is the fundamental technology for what is known as Industry 4.0, this new generation, this so far fairly mythological new generation of digital society where everything will be run with the internet of things and artificial intelligence and all that sort of stuff, right? Um, so in a certain sense, you could also characterize them at a certain, you know, as sort of a, almost a neo-Luddite movement, right? Because these were also people who were most threatened by these new technologies, right? I mean, if you are a trucker, an independent trucker owns your own truck, you're threatened by the fact that Uber might move into the trucking business, right? If you have a small cafe or a small restaurant, you're threatened by Deliveroo and Sumato that are erecting ghost kitchens and out competing. So they had a sort of a very visceral conception of, of a technological threat to their existence in ways that are very similar to the Luddites of the early 19th century. And like the Luddites in the early 19th century, they articulated their resistance in the name of defense of a social life that they understood to be natural. Right? And this natural nature of the social life was to a large extent articulated at the level of um, identities and sexual politics. Like in Italy, one focal point for this uh, anti-COVID restriction movement became something known as the DDL ZAN. And the DDL ZAN was a failed parliamentary motion to introduce more severe penalties for um, uh, uh, or slander on the basis of sexual identity, right? or offensive speech on the basis of sexual identity. Um, and it represented precisely the type of gender fluidity, fluidity that these people understood to be unnatural. Right? So, um, however, in difference to the followers of Captain Ludd, they were, um, their engagement with this technology that they restricted, their, they resisted, and their politics was almost entirely abstract. Right? The, 90, the early 19th century Luddites were actually quite concretely engaged with technology and, you know, did things like innovated different forms of, uh, of uh, spinning machines and, and, you know, engaged in, you know, debates with the concrete existence with this. But in this sort of new vax area, the resistance was mainly framed uh, in reference to, you know, fairly mythological concepts from, you know, conspiracy theory and um, the, the, the notion of the great reset, right? This is quite ironically, they talked about the great reset, which for them was the global elites who are using COVID to Im implement this profound social transformation mainly through technology, 5G and all this sort of stuff, um, and which is what they are fighting, right? Which is, which is taking away the natural way of life. But the ironic thing, of course, is that The Great Reset was actually a book by uh, the World Economic Forum's Klaus Schwab, where he proposed exactly the same thing, right? But their error, of course, in this thing is that they read the World Economic Forum's proclamation publications as if they were strategic plans of action for the global elite, right? In one sense, right? So, uh, and of course, in the end, um, influences from uh, these types of disinformation campaigns that have been flourishing at the same time, QAnon, um, conspiracy theories, alternative truths, and all this sort of stuff, right? And it's quite interesting when you go into these... Hmm, how much time do I have? Okay, very good. So it's quite interesting when you go in and, and read documents from these people. They, they produced an enormous amount of literature, 
not only blogs and online, but also books. Right? Italy had a flourishing of books related to the uh, no vaccine. Interestingly, usually uh, written by what Gaetano Salvemini called the illiterate intellectuals, that is, people who are, you know, are intellectuals, but not really, right? So, for example, there's one person called Ilaria Farini who wrote a book called The Great Reset, uh, where she, you know, Elaine listed all this sort of stuff. Um, and she used to be a journalist for a plumber trade job. Right? So she would usually write about, you know, plumbing and things like that. And she wrote this book, right? Um, and in this book, she, you know, she does a fairly adequate factual analysis of the situation, right? She says that, yes, vaccines are a ways for multinational pharmaceutical companies to make a lot of money. That's true. Uh, she says, you know, this um, platformization is going to threaten the livelihoods of a number of small-scale entrepreneurs. That's also true, right? And then she says, and then the EU wants to legalize pedophilia, right? And you get like this thing, which comes directly from the QAnon universe, right? I mean, this is one of the one of the great topics of QAnon is this pedophilic cults in pizza basements that you know that that are. So there is a certain very weird type of of political imaginary where you know what instead of a concrete engagement with these technologies and the type of consequences they might have, the reference for their politics is this entirely mythological things that are circulating. And of course, this is a long-term trend, right? This is not um, the rise of these types of alternative truths uh, have a history um, that goes back to the early 1970s, right? I mean, you could say that there was a hidden cult cultural revolution in parallel to the 1968 that we are all very uh, uh, you know, uh, aware of. Uh, the early 1970s also saw a proliferation of things like beliefs in aliens, for example, right? And von Däniken publishes his books about ancient aliens in the early 1970s. And this creates a, a growing beliefs, you know, um, there's uh, an enormous amount of, of stuff about conspiracy theory, um, alternative medicine, wellness, holistic healing, all these sorts of things are you know, growing out in the 1970s and consolidating in a, in a certain sense in the 1990s with the internet where, where all these people now find a forum where they can come together and discuss uh, the habits and intentions of space aliens and come to sort of certain consolidated truths about who they are and what they want and you know articulate a, a fairly you know consolidated cosmology around this. It's a book that's very nicely described by a book by Judy Dean called uh, Aliens in America, where she analyzes this belief in alien abduction on, and you know shows how this you know, operates as an alternative cosmology for a lot of people who are understanding themselves to be marginalized from mainstream truths, right? Particularly the downwardly mobile former white working classes in the United States, right? Are particularly prone to believe in alien abductions, etc. So, um, so in but and this was exacerbated during the COVID years by what you could call an excess of participatory culture, right? because um, the the uh, sort of the the mode of knowledge uh, production in this, you know, Novax. I mean, most of that area was mobilized by by the right, so you could call them right wingers, etc. But it's actually more complex than that, I believe, right? I think the right-wing association is something that sort of comes afterwards, it was before. But, um, and it also included a lot of people who came from the wellness world, et cetera, et cetera. And also yoga practitioners in California believed in QAnon for some reason, right? So it had a, um, but um, the mode of knowledge production for them was, you know, do your own research, right? This was the motto of QAnon was do your own research. Now, QAnon was very, very probably some sort of operation of diversion, like troll farms or something like that. Someone built it somewhere and someone who had experience in game design did it because it has that type of structure, right? You have to dig down the rabbit hole and the truth is just around the corner, et cetera, et cetera. But the imperative, do your research, right? It's not, you know, this person says this, and that's true. It's you have to inform yourself and find reason. And you and you find, and if anything else, QAnon structured the research so that it would go in certain directions. But 
all this sort of anti-vax thing was about doing your own research, right? Uh, they say that the vaccines work. Well, do your research, right? And, and the thing, of course, is that when you do your research, you have an unprecedented amount of resources at your disposition, right? Not only fake news and more or less reliable postings here and there, but actual scientific articles, right? Because so the editor of Nature right, said that during the COVID years, the number of submissions to Nature increased a hundredfold. Right? Everybody was writing about COVID, right? And not only the natural scientists, also the sociologists. So of course, this means that what COVID did was that it made the controversial nature of science public, right? I mean, everybody knows that science is not about truth, it's a controversy, right? But usually scientists hide that controversy to the backstage, to Goffman terms, right? And they present the united front to the public, right? No, no, we're experts, we know what we're talking about. Right? But in this time, you know, the controversy became public and the ordinary public had access to the outliers, to the crackpot who screams from behind in the conference, who we all, you know, we all encounter. Right? And that means that whatever type of position you had, you could always find scientific proof, right? You know, um, do the vaccines work? Well, the consensus is yes, but there are a lot of people who says no, even Nobel laureates said no, right? And you could say, no, no, there's a scientific article that shows that doesn't work. Does, uh, you know, uh, ivermectin, the, the horse medicine, does it work against COVID? No, but there's guys who say, you know, that there are studies to, to, so, so there was this type of, you know, radical precarity or ambivalence of knowledge within this excessive participatory culture. Um, in a certain sense, right? Um, so in a certain sense, you could say that this excess of participatory culture, it, it sort of collapsed the last, there was a last blow to sort of the remains of the modern public sphere, but also the modern notion of truth, in a sense, the realization of Lyotard's postmodern condition on a mass scale, in a sense, where everything is a, is a language game, right? Um, and coupled perhaps to um, the um, rooted, of course, in, in, in long-term processes of real social fragmentation, right? This was not something new and, and neither was it simply an effect of social media and the internet, right? These types of fragmentation of, of the population into different epistemic communities have real roots that go back um, till the 1970s, so to say, right? I mean, there's a wonderful book by a guy called Big Bill Bishop called The Big Sort, who shows that um, since the 1970s, um, swing counties have virtually disappeared in the US. So swing county being a county where the electoral outcome is uncertain. And, and why is that? It's because since the 1970s, people in the US have progressively started living with people who are like themselves, right? So progressives live with progressives, Christians live with Christians, right-wingers with right-wingers, left-wingers with left-wingers, et cetera, right? So you have like this basic fragmentation of the social, which has much, much deeper roots than, than just the internet and social media. Sense, right? um, and the consequence of this in a certain sense, I think was, was sort of comparable to what um, the Italian ethnologist Ernesto de Martino called the cultural apocalypse, right? So Ernesto de Martino was looking at the transformation of the Italian countryside in the 1960s, particularly the South in the 1960s and early 1970s, where, of course, the impact of migration, television, consumer society, and modernization in general was shattering a form of life that had roots that went back, in some cases, even to antiquity. Right? Um, and, react and the reaction to this was an enormous increase in magic and recourse to magic. Right? Uh, you've got a whole generation of magicians that sort of grow out in Italy in the 60s and 70s. And as late as the 90s, you could see, still see their advertisements on late night television, right? And you had an enormous explosion of things like astrology and horoscopes. And I mean, in a certain sense, the explosion of, of the top of, of the irrational, right? In a certain sense, it's a reaction to this implosion of, of the notion and truth of the rational. And that seems to be also what, what in a certain sense, marks this type of alternative to security, right? I mean, so in a certain sense, what we could see then from the COVID experience is that we have basically two alternatives in the Anthropocene, right? I mean, either we continue 
a shot in existence that is ever more structured by algorithms, ever more hygienic and ever more, ever more based on datafication and, and, you know, in a certain sense, Benjamin Bratton's dystopia of, of, uh, of, of the masked life, so to say, right? Which might very possibly be the middle class or upper middle class response to the Anthropocene, right? The way in which we live in the in the smart city where uh, you know everything we do admits data and where everything is regulated with algorithmic controls um you know if you look at a city like singapore for example they seem to have been going in that direction right they are now constructing these new types of condominiums that are basically oriented towards not having to leave the building right you have everything inside with them you know, special entrances for delivery robots, etc., and then public space is being, uh, you know, uh, datafied and controlled, and you have these policing robots that go around and will tell you if you're breaking social distances, etc., like that. And then that's probably, you know, that's a way of living in the smart city, where in a certain sense this modern bubble of security is being re-established through these very invasive. Uh, algorithmic management protocols in the name in the overarching name of security as the sort of overarching political principle and you know maybe the smart cities are then also being defended by uh, robotic machine guns against the hordes of of migrants from from the planet of slums that surrounds them in certain sense. and this is certainly the way also that we would live in space right i mean if it's true that the the sort of the dream of a of capitalism's new dream of a spatial fix to use Harvey's term is to actually go into space, right? To go to the moon or something like that. And that's that's the where you know where IPO activity is going now. Venture capital is now space tech is the hot thing, right? So even if these things aren't really technologically or you know ready or the organizational models don't really exist, there still is in the you know, in the capitalist imaginary of the future, there is these ideas, right? But of course, how we would live on a Martian colony, we would live like this, right? We would, you know, be uh, stay at home and watch Netflix and order order hamburgers from from Zomato because we can't go out slumming, really, right? So it's it's that's the type of model that you could see. And the I'm concluding now, yes. And the alternative to that seems to be nothing else than this type of return of of. Of I mean, a cultural apocalypse, the return of uh, of magical thinking and possible, you know, charismatic leaders uh, able to mobilize the desperate masses behind promises of uh, of miraculous redemption or, or similar things like that. So that's the par pars destruens of the book, right? And then you can tell me what I'm going to write in the pars costruens, perhaps. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> So I actually literally forced Adam to do this mm -hmm. because he said he is, it, it's a series of thoughts. It's a very productive uh, series of thoughts. So I'm going to start uh, before I open the floor up because all of us participated in this and it's a kind of open conversation. First is the, uh, the idea of security because you actually haven't, uh, we haven't resolved that. If, it, if we don't go back to two things, the classical model of, the, of, of security starting from Hobbes, which is really a, a theory of representation mm -hmm. to the 19th century model of security, which is highly medicalized mm -hmm. and this notion of the intervention mm -hmm. in the social body, mm -hmm. which in Hobbes is representation, mm -hmm. which Foucault mm -hmm. lays out in his lectures. We haven't gone back to that. Mm -hmm. It's in a state of flux right mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. So is there a future for security outside of the platform uh, model? And is there a future of government in, in the way that Foucault laid out in his lectures vis-a-vis uh, -vis the what was called the individual? I'm not, I'm not saying the individual, but it was called the individual. So that is the, that is the first question. And, and the second question is, on the future of politics, future of politics, which is post-COVID politics, because there is no doubt the political has in a way, kind of been reformatted. We are not going back to the earlier, mm -hmm. even though there is a call in this kind of neo-Luddite argument of, you know, of continuity, you know, and change and mm -hmm. focusing on continuity and going back. What do we go, where does the political take us? It's kind of two mm -hmm. opening questions and then I throw, throw it up. Yeah, let's go around. Uh, all of us are 
I'm gonna, I'm gonna take some COVID. notes. I yeah, think. Yeah. Do you have a pen? Thank you. Uh, thanks. I have a lot of things to think with. Uh, uh, again, it's just too much there for, for a coherent response. But a couple of things that I wanted to pull out. One is the whole promise of public health, which is not based on curative medicine, but being able to mold the circumstances that made you healthier. So everything from washing your hands to uh, ways in which you could remain healthy or better nutrition. In some senses, what came through is that this has got caught in very complicated ways with algorithmic governance, datafication, etc., which puts a serious question mark on what is public health anymore, which is progressive. Mm. So, you know, in, in some ways, if you made for a better environment, you are probably going to have better health and therefore less need for private you know, curative care. But you're saying that side of anticipating and changing things is caught up in this mm. massive, which obviously then one has to think through what would be a, a, a helpful transformative public health agenda. But the other thing that struck me was you know, this, this call for this, this distinction that you make between the neoliberals and the actual ones, uh, where if in the earlier times there is a concrete mm. engagement with the existing technology, here you're saying a lot of this is mythical and abstract, mm. but isn't much of what you're calling algorithmic governance or governance by data yes, itself yes. mythical. Yeah, mm, mm, mm. And therefore, a lot of that engagement mm. is naturally at that mm. level. Mm. Yeah, thanks, Adam. That was quite a breadth of vision. So, so I'm going to ask you a similarly large question, you know, with full realization that there cannot be one answer to that. So I just want to understand what your stake is in the idea of the social. Hmm. And I ask this because as we know, the very concept of the social has ha by itself had a deeply governmentalized exclusionary uh, history. Um, and the fact that uh, the social has been the foundation of all kinds of modern disciplines uh, from social science and sociology, but, but also the economy, uh, the state, mm. uh, which are all in some senses shadows. So state society, economic society, they are kind of uh, shadow mimics of each other, right? I mean, there have been two counter arguments to putting too much stake in the social. One is the argument that, have been, that has been made by um, radical voices from within societies, such as somebody like B. R. Ambedkar would repeatedly say in the context of India that India may be a nation, but it's not a society, right? Mm. It's only a society in so far as it is the shadow of the state. Mm. Mm. Uh, mm. In, in actual terms of sociality, mm. it's not a society. So I do not have a stake in something called Indian society. Mm. Scholarship on the Anthropocene, on the other hand, makes, the same, makes a similar argument, but from a different side, which would say that there has never been something purely human called society mm. in any case. Mm. So our lives are a kind of network of mm. humans with animals and machines and uh, uh, landforms and mm. atmosphere and so on and so forth. Mm. So therefore the very concept of society mm. is in some ways obsolete mm. if, mm. if we actually take the Anthropocene mm. seriously. Mm. So in that larger context mm. of critique of society mm. as a category, mm. uh, I wanted to ask you why put mm. the investment mm. in that mm. term? 
them? Would you like to gather all of them or respond immediately? Well, maybe you can have. Okay. Uh, uh, I would like to ask on the concept of social. I mean, that would be very relevant uh, for our discussion. So would you see the social in a similar way as the state of exception and post state of exception? What would be the contour of social in both realm? Second, are we not moving from security to not only bare life, but from number to non-numbers? And, and that is very much visible in the context of COVID-19 when we see the transition from governmentalization to non-existence of uh, being. In the case of uh, bio or in case of bare life, at least there is a being which is negated or uh, that is governmentalized, governmentalized in case of Foucault. Mm. But we see the third development possibly that is non-recognition, non-existence of being by number or by laws. So do we need to look at beyond Agamben and Foucauldian formulation in the case of COVID-19? Thank you. <laughs> I mean, these, these questions are getting progressively more difficult. So I... <laughs> yeah. One thing that I, you know, uh, I, I wished to, you touched upon was this how's all of this related uh, to the idea of a new idea of death, for example, what, and what, what, what? The, the death, ah. right? Uh, I mean, surely there's something that has changed, right? During the COVID, we have generations don't remember deaths in mm. such numbers mm. and they have seen, everybody has lost somebody or the other. So, so this radical precarity, how do we you know, uh, see this new knowledge emerging after this mm. moment mm. where death has to be central, right? Mm. Of course, there's a larger crisis, ge geological crisis, mm. et cetera, and we can read a continuity, right? Mm where COVID is not ex an exception. These things are happening everywhere, every season, something or the other, natural catastrophe, etc. So I, I wonder whether, you know, that uh, has concerned uh, uh, Theris at all. Well, well, do the first one. So, so I'm, can I start from death? Because then we can move from death to the social. Uh, it sounds very... Uh, <laughs> yeah, or, or um, yeah. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, I think one of the things that, that COVID introduced, of course, is the sort of the presence of death, right? Um, in, in, in ways that negates the whole sort of modern, uh, modern impetus, because the modern impetus is, of course, to externalize death from life, right? I mean, we know this, right? Elias and everybody else, right? And, Silicon entrepreneurs are now dreaming about negating death completely, right? And in certain sense, but of course, COVID taught us that death in a certain sense is coming back, right? Um, and if we take seriously the argument of the Anthropocene or, or whatever term you want to use, um, it's probably quite likely to say that, you know, the coming decades are going to make death more present, right? Uh, and we're going to exit these, you know, historically, very, very low death rates that we have right now. Right? I mean, um, you know, just as a matter of comparison, I mean, I don't want to relativize the COVID experience and say anything that it wasn't terrible or anything like that, but the global death rates in 2019 was, I think, around 7.9 per mil. Right? Um, COVID, uh, COVID death rates in three years was 0 0.9 per mil of the global population. Right? So it increased it with almost one per mil in three years. Um, but if you split that with three, it'd be 0 0.3 of every year. Of course, these statistics are just, you know, like that, of course, it's much more complicated and uneven distributions, et cetera, et cetera. But global death rates in 1973 was 12.5 per mil. So much, much higher than they were over the COVID years, right? So um, will we go back to death rates of 1973? We will go back to death rates of the 1930s. They were about 30 per million in the 1930s. Right? 
uh, where we have much more present deaths, right? And how we will react to that, right? And and that uh, and, and can we find ways of living with that that do not entail shutting down sociality and the economy and and, and everything else, right? Which um, you know, and and uh, this is also bearing a little bit on the argument of society because, of course, I mean, I. If you think about the uh, um, so the the literature of the Anthropocene that you that you quote right on on the notion of, of sort of the, we have never been modern these boundaries are fictitious in some way right um, that also contains in the certain sense and and at certain points an ethical imperative right if you take someone like Donna Haraway's work for example right she says that we need to decenter the the human experience right and, we, and the anthropocentric notion of of a social and include Right, the symbiosis, the others, animals, other actors, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but if we do that, that of course inevitably means that the sensicity of human life, which has been the basis of at least the Western tradition, but I think the global tradition, right, uh, will be decentered as well. Right, you know, if we need to take into concern the um, legitimate requirements of animals, rivers, habitats, or even viruses, perhaps, and weigh them against the value of a human life, then the human life is no longer sacrosanct, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and we have lived, I mean, at least in the West, we have lived in the shadow of Auschwitz in the whole post one. I mean, we're going back to, and the only place, you know, Auschwitz being the concentration camps being the only place where these things violated. Uh, so in that case, of course, how in that case, uh, do we establish uh, an ethics that is able to deal with these types of relativity of human life in ways that are not downright fascist? Right? Is it possible to have a democratic Thanato politics? Right? That's a pretty difficult question, right? To to have in that sense, right? Uh, but I think it's a question that needs to be formulated, and, and that's actually one of the discussions that I'm trying to engrace in the second part of the book in the past construct, sort of sense, right? How could we, I mean, not that I'm true to have any solution to it, of course, right? But I mean, what would the concept and the issues to, to think about in relation to that? How, what, what could they be, right? Uh, and that, of course, leads in a certain sense to the question of, of the social again, right? I mean, you're completely right, of course, in pointing at this, uh, you know, this very in a certain sense, uh, partial perspective that the social entails, right? Um, and but I guess I mean I guess I am damaged by my upbringing, right? I mean I grew up in social democrat Sweden, so I thought that in a certain sense, you know, there there is some sort of residue of the idea that things can somehow be rationally managed, right? And that the notion of the social that I, that that I'm having has in a, it's a Durkheimian notion in that sense, right? You know, what is the social? The social is the antithesis of chaos in a certain sense, right? It's a way of, you know, uh, of, of, of creating order in complexity or at least sort of having some way of rational way of addressing these questions that otherwise will, uh, I mean, I find one of the weaknesses uh, among people like Donna Haraway uh, and a lot of similar types of thought, right? Uh, is that if you don't have a social, how do you address the conflicts that would inevitably arise from this type of opening up uh, to a larger diversity than the anthropocentric, right? Um, a lot of people now are talking about, a very fashionable top topos is to point at, um, you know, the beauty of the, marginal, the small scale, the queer, etc. right? That somehow is supposed to have to be sort of superior to the mainstream and the organ. Now, Timothy Morton, uh, the guy who wrote the book during COVID. Yeah, I'm not gonna say what I think about that book, but anyways, uh, where he said this, that we have to look at hypo subjects, right? Hypo, well, by the hypo subject, he means like this, the marginal, the queer thing. But, you know, Actional hypo subjects are actually not very nice, usually, right? I mean, they're not liberal, democratic, uh, feminist. Uh, you know, they're they're 
pretty nasty, a lot of them, right? And these actual hyposubjects, they are going to, you know, if there's not any overall regulation and rationality, these hyposubjects are going to wage war with each other, right? I mean, you can very well uh, have your um, community where you uh, live in symbiosis and grow or organic wheat, and um, but at some point, the biker gang from down the valley is going to come and steal your carrots, right? So there is a, uh, you know, there is a need in a certain sense for considering this. What is the principle? You know, can there be a principle of society in that sense that is, that goes beyond society in the modern sense, that is both planetary and inclusionary, right? And maybe that is simply not possible. That's also, that was, I mean, maybe the, the alternative is barbary, right? Uh, no, that's also a possible answer. But uh, so, so that's the way, you know, the reason in the sense that I want to invoke the, the social, right? And and coming to your thing on the on the, um, I mean, it's very interesting that precisely the thing that you're raise, raising, like the you know notions of uh, long term public health, like diets, habits, things like that, were actually what was raised by a lot of the no vaxxers as alternatives to vaccines. Right? They were saying that you know these vaccines are just another sort of allopathic solution, right? The real solution would be if we increased our levels of immunological resistance and if we managed to, you know, engage in diets and life habits that are healthier, which would increase our tolerance, you know, against. And, and maybe that is also, you know, some part of the answer. Maybe that is also something that, you know, if we do need to encounter death and risk in ways that are more present, then maybe we also need to become more resilient in certain ways, right? Uh, in and um, yeah, I'll, I'll stop there. I think for no more mm. Great. Um, thank you very much for this interesting talk. So I wanted to come back to this idea of the hypo-intellectual and some of the things that you were saying about it, illiterate intellectuals. Mm. I, mean, I think it's really interesting. And I was wondering if you could maybe say a little bit more about your view of the role of the intellectual or maybe even a critical progressive intellectual, because I think in a lot of ways, there's been this kind of siding with the, the scientific knowledge regime that is currently in place. So yes, of course, we should all get vaccinated. Yes, of course, the people who are against vaccinations are really quite wrong. But it seems almost like those positions sort of miss the longstanding left critiques of vaccines or of science mm. or of the, the powers of science and mm. technology that have been taking place for a long time. So it seems like a little bit like betraying in some sense the generative or progressive potential that might be late in, in some of these mm. movements and even though they're not the best articulated so they might end up saying you know there are pedophiles who are trying to take over europe like there there may still in those worlds be critiques that are, mm. are worth listening to so mm. I'm, I'm i'm interested in how you think about this kind of politics mm. of knowledge and the people who are on the margins who keep getting marginalized by more mainstream science, mm. but that may, for at least critical thinkers, be worth uh, attending to in terms of the critiques that they're mm. actually bringing to some of these questions. Mm. Well, thank you uh, very much. Uh, in terms of uh, the book you plan to write, I have a question. Your basic approach, did I hear right, is sort of neo Gramscian. I mean, you try to define somewhat um, uh, industrial social constellation that is new, that is changing as compared. So you made many, uh, develop many lineages into the 1970s. That is just a question in terms of the basic framing. Mm. On, 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 on top of that, now you would develop at least that is the way I understood it, a sort of a great divide in, in societies. Mm -hmm. And I mean, with all the differences one might make um, between various countries. But I wonder whether this great divide, and, and, and the question would be, is now this great divide for you understood in a sort of a 
ideal type. I mean, ideal mm -hmm. types, which now a lot of many variables that come together and uh, there's a lot of spectrum in between. Or is it, I mean, if it's more like a clear, and that's how I understood it, if it's a clear cut um, divide, isn't that not a little too simple an argument to understand our society, especially if you look at not just under the concept of security, but uh, of risk, of risks that differentiate that became so splintered between groups. I just just come to my mind, came to my mind a study recently in Germany on the cohort of the 20 year olds, I mean, much younger than, not all, but uh, much younger than most of us. And the argument was basically there was never in history a cohort of the early 20s that was so highly differentiated. And differentiation, I mean, you can make in consumption style, but you can also make it in consumer and but you can also make it in terms of risk styles. And if you, I mean, look at society now in terms of risk, I have the feeling the spectrum is much, much broader, much more mm. diffuse and much more probably also shifting in terms of formation, in terms of political mm. formation, which you made very strong as if I understood it right, uh, can take. I mean, that would be the question. I mean, the important point we, we had this talk about a little yesterday already, I mean, is the idea of preventive society. I mean, which preventive society, which used to be the social state as the mm. curative state, mm. so to say, the medical mm. state. Uh, do you see here a new, I mean, in your, if it is a uh, approach, a new really a formation of, different types of security that come together and you and that is my feeling so I would not be able perhaps also not as a historian be able to describe exactly what is going on right now thank you yeah thank you Adam for the talk I just to a uh, simple question what will happen to the class sure. because you think you ask I mean in your talk, you talk about a lot of people who are talking about biocommon or a new citizenship mm. or, uh, I mean, individual mm. in that sense. And especially in a way you mm. mentioned that there were impact and perception of experience of COVID mm. is quite uneven in that mm. way. So would it be a, uh, the new form, new kind of solidarity building up will build up or something or the reiterating of the older mm. sort of, or you mm. think if the status quo will remain the same? and I'm auditing this lecture in the capacity of an economics and politics student. So my question was more along the lines of the political. And when you spoke about security, what I took away from that was the fact that people are looking for new forms of security post pandemic. And that might also feed into the fact that much of not just the global North, but also the global South, of course, with the exceptions of Brazil, might elect populist leaders and there's there might be a resurgence of the right wing mm. take for example italy i think the prime minister is um heavily conservative very anti-lgbtqia plus so do you think that it's because of the inherent fear of the unknown and the way the society has reacted to something which has not been seen for the past century has something to do with the fact that security as an idea, and I'm coming from a very economic perspective because you also spoke about financialization of society, right? So do you think that there's, an, there's, there's, a, there's a race, much like the gold rush, there's a race to find a new spot of security? That's it. Okay. And these are really interesting questions, but I don't think I'm able to answer them, right? Because they're all, I mean, in a certain sense, all of you have raised these 
concepts that I try to struggle with in thinking about what the second half of the book might look like. And I'm sure like this is a doomed project. This is going to go on for forever, right? I'm never going to publish it. Maybe I'll just have to, <laughs> I'm not going to be able to, because these are, you know, incredibly different, difficult questions, right? In different ways. And I, you know, um, uh, where to start, right? I mean, um, well, I start with the easiest one. Are they ideal types? Yes. And so, of course, it's, I mean, in a certain sense, um, these two uh, notions of security and, and, um, um, and, precarity, what I call it, the precarity of truth, et cetera. Of course, you know, of course they are ideal, typical. I mean, of course the, the reality is much messier, but on the other hand, you know, you could also say that the, the sort of the, uh, the, the concentrating power of COVID made them almost what Marx would call real abstractions in some sense, right? You know, things that were, you know, the, they almost came to, the ideal types almost came to life for a short period. And then maybe, you know, now things are reverting back to a more messy, existence in some way right i mean the the purpose of using these categories is, is not so much descriptive as, as much as it is to sort of try to highlight the uh you know the essence of the past destruence which is sort of say to sort of show that you know what is left of modernity is sort of ending up in this way right either as security or as this type of irrationality in a certain sense right um Neo Gramscian, yes, I would love to be Neo Gramscian if I could. I mean, this is what I really, I really aspire to, right? Because it would be really great to be able to sort of begin to think about, you know, what could, um, I mean, if we come back to the question of the social, etc., for there to be an evolution, transformation of the social, there needs to be a new social block that can somehow drive it, right? And and because the ideas are not lacking, right? If you have so many ideas for, uh, you know, for what a uh, an Anthropocene existence could look like, everything from going into space to going doing degrowth to, uh, you know, Peter Turchin is talking about civilizational evolution and all these things, right? But what we, we don't have is an idea about who's going to realize this, right? Uh, that's something that is completely absent in a certain sense, right? Mm -hmm. and, and a question that is, of course, incredibly difficult, but also very, con you know, contradictory, because I think in a certain sense, we have, you know, there is a, a you know, as an unprecedented form of real unification of, you want to call it the working class or the productive classes or, 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 or you know, of, around the world, right? Uh, the world economy has never been so integrated as it is now, even though in the last years we have this breaking up of global supply chains, et cetera. But particularly with new information and communication technologies, there is a, uh, there is a sort of a, um, 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 an integration of, of, of also in a sort of a worldwide general intellect in a certain sense that, that people in generally partake in, right? Uh, but at the same time, these things are, of course, ideologically extremely fragmented, right? I mean, the, the, um, the, uh, the queer denken in Germany are, not all of them, but are, are linked to movements that are assisting migration, yet they are structurally basically at the same position as the African market traders that you can find in around, you know, in the pirate economy, et cetera, et cetera, right? And they're the same, same type of economic activity, similar type of aspirations and desires, etc., but still, you know, kept apart in these ways, right? So how do you, uh, you know, how can you configure any a type of, you know, recomposition of such a social block? And I think in order to do that, what is needed is also uh, an overcoming of the present, right? I mean, that's also some of the reasons that Gramsci teaches, I think, is that you don't get a social block without an idea. Right? The social block needs to have an idea of itself as being the carrier of a more rational or a more evolved social model. Otherwise, it simply doesn't form. Right? So, and that's also then something that, that is incredibly lack lacking in a sense. Right? And that, that leads, of course, us to the question of, of, uh, of intellectuals right? that you raised. Right? In a certain sense, I mean, it's true that there is a, um, 
I mean, there's definitely a, I think there's definitely a, um, there's a collapse of the traditional left in a sense. I mean, I think you saw that in a little bit in COVID, right? And you're seeing it definitely afterwards, right? I mean, in, uh, you know, in, in, with the possible exception of US with Biden, but that might also have been a Furic victory. We'll see what happens next time, right? But I mean, definitely in, in I mean, in Europe, the leftist parties are basically disintegrating in any ways, right? And that, but, but also the, the leftist intellectuals during COVID, in a certain sense, they, um, you know, they they somehow manifested they their almost complete inability to relate to and, and sympathize with the plight of of ordinary people. Right? There, there became very much this sort of defense of 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 the you know somewhat high uh, high level morality of a, of a of a relatively privileged class of knowledge workers, etc. Um, and, and at the same time, then, of course, there is a, a tremendous, I mean, this participatory culture that we talked about, the excess of a participatory culture. Well, excess, of course, from, from sort of our rational, uh, well-educated point of view, right? But then the other way of seeing this, of course, is that there is a, this enormous um, mass intellectuality, as Paolo, Paolo Virno talked about, right? I mean, everybody is now able to form their opinion about what's going on in a certain sense right and you know i'm realized that i'm blabbering right because i don't have you know but i mean of course if you want to think about <laughs> you want to think about neo gramscian social block and class recomposition then of course this type of mass intellectuality is something that needs to be capitalized upon right i mean you could also say i mean i don't know how conspirational uh, you want to be right sometimes it's difficult in sociology to distinguish conspiracy theory from what used to be called structural causation right <laughs> <laughs> you know if I'm, you know if we can wait a little bit on this thin line right um you know the, the q and on and all these sorts of things i mean of course were highly efficient ways of diffusing mass intellectuality in a certain sense, right? Of leading it astray in a certain way, of giving it certain certain lines, right? And we don't know, I mean, how and to what extent this was the result of manipulation and who did it and why, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, certainly there is large documentations of the fact that a lot of, I mean, you would know that, for example, right? Contemporary public opinion is to a large extent the effect of conscious manipulation, troll farms and, other types of interventions here and there, right? So, um, you know, we don't really know to what extent that is the, the, the things, I mean, the way in which this Novax universe went into this irrational direction is probably partly, of course, because of a, a betrayal of the left, right? I mean, if you were a serious leftist, you would be there with a the queer denk and then tell them, comrades, it's not the aliens, it's capitalism, right? Uh, well, <laughs> but but you didn't do that right so that's a betrayal of the left in that sense but that left also opened a space for for this sort of intervention of this type of of sort of manipulative uh, energies right so maybe the question is actually quite simple right there needs to be a going to the people in the sense of on the part of the left in in ways that are are uh, quite traditional actually right so um yeah, algorithms. I think that's a great point that you think about think for power is abstract because power actually is abstract. That is probably a, you know, a, a very, um, a, um, a very interesting point, right? And and there must be some ways in which um, these algorithms can be dethroned in some way also. No, where this type of reified power that they are conceived to have can be brought back into life in different ways right that's i mean also because you know a lot of the debates on on and we see this abstraction working very much in in in, in, in debates on technology like the idea that uh that somehow you know artificial intelligence is going to take over or is going to change and create some sort of post-humanist revolution or or even you know less less methodologically to say that 
you know, automation is going to take over all jobs and all those sort of things. I mean, there is a tendency now to ascribe this enormous power to these things, which probably has to do with the fact that there is a, a lack of this, uh, of, of a politics that departs from the, the concrete in some way, right? So, yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. And that is, I think, intellectually generous for the simple reason that all of us could participate. Usually people present on one topic and boom. And I know it was, it was, it was kind of provisional, speculative. You said so. So thank you very much. Uh, and uh, I hope you come again once the book is done. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank